All right. This afternoon, we're in the New Testament, right? We're in the Old Testament this morning. Now we're in the New Testament. We're in the second book of the four Gospels, the book of Mark. So I'm going to be considering Mark, uh, chapter 8, beginning verse 27 to the end of the chapter. And then I'm going to draw your attention to, in our ongoing catechetical series on the basics of our Christian faith, by looking at question and answers uh, 31 and 32 of this document that we've been working through called the Heidelberg Catechism. As we, we focus, as I said, on the fundamentals of our faith, and you can't get any more fundamental than this, who Jesus is and who we are as Christians. Those are the simple two things that we're going to be addressing um, uh, tonight. Before, before we begin, I want to... Um, I want to read you something from uh, 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 an article in the Gospel Coalition simply entitled, Your Preparation to Be a Martyr Starts Now. And I want you just to, to, to listen to this. And it's a reminder of what some brothers and Christians uh, are experiencing around the world. Maybe if, if John and Renee were with us right now, they would say, yeah, we've, we've uh, experienced that a little more close to home than, than most of you. They would say to us. On February 15, I don't know if you remember this, but on February 15, 2015, members of ISIS beheaded 20 Coptic uh, Egyptian Christians on the shores of Libya, the country of Libya. Do you remember that? I, I have, um, I have uh, vague memories of that. Um, I saw a photo of that, not of these individuals getting beheaded, but um, it, was a, it was a photo where you had a series of a number of men, it says here 20, just lined up, and they're on their knees, and their heads were bowed, and they're ready to be executed. It was on the, on the shores of, uh, of the country of, of Libya. I don't know if you remember that. but it's, uh, The writer says, Most of the slain men hailed from a poor village in upper Egypt and were working in Libya to simply send money home to their families. Just before they were executed, the martyrs were heard softly but boldly declaring in Arabic, Ya Rabbi Yeshua. O Lord Jesus. Through their, uh, through their suffering witness, the, the 20 imitated the examples of many martyrs from the early church period. In the mid-third century, a believer named Carpus refused to make pagan sacrifices, confessing, I am a Christian. And his fellow martyr, Papias, added, I have served Christ from my youth, and I have never offered sacrifice to idols. I am a Christian. During his trial, which resulted in his exile and later execution, Bishop Cyprian of Carthage, who died in A.D. 258, testified, very simply, I am a Christian. Justin Martyr, who died A.D. 165, said, I have committed myself to the two true doctrines of the Christians, the belief that we piously hold regarding the God of the Christians. Now, it kind of struck me as I was reading their responses how um, there, was, there was no sectarian spirit or expression in them where they said, well, I, I, I am a Coptic or I am a Presbyterian, or I am a Baptist, or anything like that, although we need to designate ourselves such on the basis of our theology and history. I get that. But when it came time to give of their lives, they either said, I am of Christ, or I am a Christian. Which makes me wonder, how would we define those very things? If we say that we're followers of Christ, what does it mean that we're confessing his name? What does the name Christ mean? And what does the name Christian mean? What does it mean that we are Christians? I'm going to pose that, those two questions to you, by the way, at the, at, at, as soon as we're done reading the scripture and from the Heidelberg Catechism. So, so I want you to think about that right now. Okay, Think about what answer you're going to give to who is Jesus Christ and what does it mean the word Christian, okay, those two things, and then we're going to do it at the beginning rather than having questions and answers as a discussion period after the sermon, okay? So let's first read from Mark chapter 8. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, 
Some said John the Baptist, and others said Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So we're going to end our reading at that point. Now I want to draw your attention to question and answers 31 and 32 as we continue our catechetical series dealing with the name Christ and also the name Christian. So, why, simple question, why is he, that is Jesus, why is he also called Christ that is anointed? Let's say it together. Because he has been ordained by God the Father and anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption. Our only high priest, who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us and who continually intercedes for us before the Father. And our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit and who defends and preserves us in the redemption obtained for us. Wow, that's kind of a mouthful, isn't it? All, all of this revolving around the name Christ. Now, following this, why are you called a Christian? And let's say together, because I am a member of Christ by faith and thus share in his anointing, so that I may, as prophet, confess his name, as priest, present myself a living sacrifice of thanksgiving to him, and as king, fight with a free and good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. All right. Now, with those two mouthfuls, we'll, we're basically focusing on issues relating to identity. Identity. The identity of Jesus and the identity of who we are. The identity or who Jesus Christ is and who we are. So, ready? Just, I want to take just one minute short with this. It's a warm afternoon, so I don't want to belabor this. I want to ask you a simple question, and I just want whatever first comes to your mind. Kids, I want you to listen to, because I want you to be involved in this, okay? So, what is, the, what is the first thing that comes to mind if someone was to ask you, who is Jesus Christ? What are you going to say? Anyone? My Savior, okay, that's one. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about Jesus Christ, right? So we could probably talk a long time about it. So my Savior, what else? The Son of God. My Savior, the Son of God, what else? The Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus is different than the Holy Spirit, but nice try. We're gonna, actually, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit later on in this series, probably a number of months from now. But thank you for, for your contribution. Thank you for saying something. Okay, so far we have Savior. We have the Son of God. What else? Oh boy, we got too many. Go ahead. The Anointed One. Very good. Someone's listening to the catechism. Ah. Okay, anyone else? One more. I heard something back here. Mediator. Mediator. Okay, so there's a lot we could say about Jesus. We just scratched the surface. Now, who is a Christian? Or what does it mean to be a Christian? What's the one thing that comes to mind? A follower of Christ, thank you. What else? Child of God, good. What else? 
A lot could be said. What, do you, what comes to mind when you think Christian? Christ. Pardon me? Redeemed? Okay, good. Set free through Christ? One other one. The cross? Did I hear that? The cross. What, what do you mean by that? Okay, so, so a Christian is one who's been saved from their sins through Jesus' work on the cross. All right, like I said, there's, there's many things that we could say, right? So let's say that you're doing a survey, and this is what I would love to do with this church with some 20-somethings here. And the 20-somethings, I would love to do a survey. And I'd like to go downtown, do a survey. It would not have to be uh, an evangelism project. So much as just a survey. And just to get an understanding of where the people of Abbotsford are at who happen to be downtown. You can spend just an hour or two doing that. And just doing a simple survey where you just encourage the people by saying, you know what, would you be willing to take a survey? I'm not trying to sell you anything. But I just want, I want to have a survey as to, and then you ask them these questions like, you know, who, who is Jesus to you? Um, what does it mean to be a Christian? Now, if you're downtown, let's say you're doing that survey and you ask people the question, who is Jesus Christ? You're going to get, obviously, you're going to get a lot of different answers. And, and as they say, Abbotsford is the Bible Belt of B.C. I'm still trying to figure out what that really means, you know, and how deep that goes. But let's say you're, you're doing a survey downtown and the person happens to be a Christian. What kind of answer are you going to get regarding the name Jesus Christ? Or who is Jesus? And they're going to say, well, as a Christian, Jesus is kind of like what we said here. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus saves me from my sins. Uh, Jesus is um, the one who Christians worship and these kinds of things. And if they're not very familiar with the Christian faith, you're going to hear things like, well, I think Jesus was... Uh, either a myth or Jesus was a true historical figure. Well, what kind of historical figure? Well, maybe he was a great teacher or he was one who wanted to point people to God or he's a great moral man or he's a prophet of some kind. It's just you're going to get all these kinds of answers. And if you follow it up with, well, who is a Christian to you? If there are Christians themselves, they're going to mimic a lot of what we heard here. Well, a Christian is a follower of Jesus Christ. A Christian is one who has had their sins saved by Jesus Christ. Uh, a Christian is a follower of Jesus Christ and these kinds of things. And if they're not from the Christian faith, they may get a little bit snarky. And they may say things like, well, uh, a Christian is one who believes in a myth, believes in a hoax. A Christian is a, in my mind, a Christian is a hypocrite. They're ones who confess one thing but live another, and you're going to just these kinds of things. Now, why do I take just a few minutes to quickly go through this? Because this is exactly what Jesus is doing here in this passage. Jesus is dealing with the question of his identity. In fact, he poses that very question to his disciples. But Jesus, by the way, also is dealing with what should be our identity as followers of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at those two things. Without further ado, as I said, it's a warm uh, afternoon, so let's get right into it. As we look at this passage from Mark chapter 8, um, Jesus has entered into a region called Caesarea Philippi, which is, uh, commentators will tell you that that's what we call Gentile territory, non-Jewish territory. So the 12 disciples of Jesus are from Jewish background. Um, but they've entered into non-Jewish territory, and it's while they're in this geographical location that Jesus poses a very simple question to his disciples, and that's this. Who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Now, you notice that Jesus didn't pose that question to his disciples. I mean, it's, it's going to come on the heels of this, but not now. So Jesus says, who do people say that I am? In other words, Jesus wants to know what people are thinking about him and what people are saying about him because he and his disciples are preaching the gospel of the kingdom in a lot of different geographical locations. They have had some experience doing that. And now Jesus is asking his disciples, among all these locations where he's been, what are people saying about me? What are people thinking about me? You think? And and a number of the disciples, they, they respond to Jesus' question, and I don't know if they, it took some time to respond or they just launched right in, but they, 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 um, they said, well, some think, some think that you're, you're John the Baptist and some think that you're Elijah the prophet and some think that you are 
in Matthew's account, because the passage that we're dealing with is in what we call all three Gospels of what we call the synoptics. That's the first three of the four Gospels, so in Matthew, Mark, Luke. And in Matthew's account, in Matthew's account, um, he also includes the prophet Jeremiah. So the, so the disciples are saying, some think that you're John the Baptist, some think that you're Jeremiah, some think that you're Elijah the prophet, and some, and then it's this kind of catch-all phrase, some think that you're just some prophet. Right, so there's there's a lot of confusion about who Jesus is, just as there are a lot of confusion about who Jesus is in our world today. Right? Well, you say, why, why would they respond in that way? Well, because you you got to enter into the the mind of the times. Here, Jesus is; he's new on the ground, and he's preaching and he's performing miracles, and many people are hearing about this and are like, "Who in the world is this? Is this actually the Messiah? Or is he someone else?" So, so the disciples are hearing, some people think that Jesus is John the Baptist. Now, if you know anything about John the Baptist, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. He's the way who prepared for the arrival of Jesus in time. But many people at this time had never seen John the Baptist. They had heard about him, but they've never really seen him. So they thought, well, maybe now that we see Jesus, maybe, maybe he's John the Baptist. And some said, maybe he's Jeremiah the prophet or Elijah the prophet, and you say, huh, why would they say that? Because if you know your Bibles, you know that Elijah and Jeremiah have been long dead. So what's the deal with that? Well, there is an understanding in some Jewish circles that when the Messiah arrived, one of the indications of that is that Jeremiah and Elijah would come back to life and they would bear testimony to that. So maybe, maybe Jesus isn't the Messiah. Maybe he's Jeremiah or maybe he's Elijah pointing the way to the Messiah. And finally, some gave this catch-all phrase, maybe he's just, you know, maybe he's just uh, some other prophet. A lot of people like that today. Some just think that Jesus is this, uh, this great moral teacher, this, this special individual, moral man, some prophet. Um, I was going to give you a quote here at this point by, by C.S. Lewis. I'm going to forego that. I'm going to just keep going here. So, so there's, there's just a lot of, there's, there's a lot of people today, as during Jesus' time, like who, who exactly is he? Who is the Christ? Who is the Christ? Who is this Jesus? So, so Jesus moves on, and he, and, and he, and now we're going to get to understand who Jesus actually is. So after saying to his disciples, who do people say that I am? Jesus poses this question now directly to his disciples. And Jesus says, okay, not only who do people say that I am, but now, now who do you say that I am? And the you there in the original language is in the plural. So Jesus is addressing his disciples as a whole. But it's, it's who's the one who responds to that question of, of, of Jesus? Well, it's Peter. And, and, and there's a reason for that. Peter is viewed as a leader among the disciples, but Peter has a tendency, if you know the Bible, to, to kind of just jump out there. He's kind of a compulsive figure or impulsive figure. So Peter responds by saying, well, um, you're, you're the Christ. You're the Christ. Now, Peter, if you know him, like I said, he was impulsive, and there's a lot of times when in, in an impulsive spirit, he just stuck his foot in his mouth, and he, he, would say, he would say something rather inappropriate, and we'll get to that in just a moment, okay? But for now, this is his shining moment, okay? This is his hour. He says, you are the Christ, and we go, ding, ding, ding. It's the right answer. You are the Christ, okay? But um, what does that mean, Christ? What does it mean, Christ? Um, if, if, if before reading this passage and maybe before reciting this, this document, this catechetical document that we're going through, if I asked you the question, what does the name Christ really mean? What would, what would you say to that? I think there's, there's a lot of us, even if we grew up in the Christian faith, that would kind of struggle with that. And this is why it's good to go through a catechetical series. Now, you have, you have the name Jesus Christ. Jesus is the name that we looked at last week, if you're here, and you remember that the name Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew, right, wow. Jesus in the Greek, is Jesus' personal name, and it points to who he is as it means savior or deliverer. So again, when the angel Gabriel came to, to Joseph, 
and informed that he and Mary were going to have a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, right? He said, when that child is born, you are not going to name him yourself. I'm going to give you the name, and the name is Jesus, Savior, Deliverer, for he will save his people from their sins. So that's Jesus' personal name. When we get to Christ, this is more his formal name. It's his, it, it relates to what we call his office or his calling, right? And so when we think of, of who the Christ is, the word Christ means Moshiach, it means Messiah. It means, as was told us earlier, right? It means that he is the anointed one. Anointed to do what? Anointed means set apart and also empowered to be a prophet and a priest and a king. Those three things, those three things. Now, if you, if you think about it, this kind of, kind of rounds out who Jesus is. So, so what you have is you have the, the name Christ given by Peter, but what, what, the, what the catechism does is kind of fills this out on the basis of other scriptures and what the other scriptures teaches us, that not only is the Messiah and he is the anointed one, but you have to ask yourself the question, what does it mean, anointed to do what? Well, when you look at the rest of Scripture, it's to be prophet and a priest and king. But what does that really mean? What does it really mean? I want to um, draw your attention uh, for just a moment. If you put up question answer 31, okay? Now, before I address this, we have to, to realize something that when, when we deal with the subject of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king, um, this is not something that this, this, this document called the Catechism says, well, this is important to know, but it's actually rooted in the Bible itself. So, for instance, if you look at the Old Testament, you see that there are three callings of Christ. You have, or are three callings of official callings in the life of Israel. You have prophets, priests, and kings. Now, we know that there are many prophets in the Bible, right? If you, if you look, you, you learn this when you go through catechism classes, uh, or Bible studies, you learn that there are four major prophets and there are 12 minor prophets, and in the Bible there are many more prophets even than that, many prophets. There are many priests. We think of Aaron the high priest or Joshua the high priest, and then there are many kings. There's many kings from Judah and Israel. And what we find in the Old Testament is that the, the prophets were not to do the work of the priests, and the priests were not to do the, the, the work of the kings, and if you, mix, if you mingled those things together, it made God very upset. You think of King Saul. I don't know if you remember the story, but King Saul at one point offered a sacrifice. Uh, he did a priestly work, and, and you know, Saul thought, what's wrong with that? That's a good thing. And when you first read it, you go, what's wrong with that? It was because those offices were not to be mingled, right? They were to remain separate. But what you have is in Jesus Christ, those three offices, prophet, priest, and king, are fused into one person and that is Christ, and he carries the responsibility and the callings of all three, and that's why the catechism spells this out for us. Take a look at it. What does Christ do as a prophet? Well, as a chief prophet and teacher, it's his task as any prophet to fully reveal to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption. He reveals the way of God to us and the way to salvation it means the forgiveness of sins and restoration into a relationship with god he reveals that to us that's why when you look at the ministry of jesus what you find is that the primary ministry of jesus was not even to perform miracles the miracles are simply designed to underscore the importance of and the validity of the word that jesus is preaching and teaching as a prophet now for the sake of time move on jesus is our only high priest well, what was the priest do a priest prays, but also what a priest does is he sa offers sacrifices on behalf of the people of God in order to restore them to fellowship with God. When did Jesus do that? He did it on the cross. And you think about this, Jesus not only offered the sacrifice, but he was the sacrificer. He was both as a high priest. And even now that Jesus is risen into glory, he continues his high priestly work in praying for us, in interceding for us before the Father. Finally this, Jesus is our eternal king. 
governs us by his word and spirit, and he defends and preserves us in the redemption that he has obtained for us. What does a king do? A king rules. And Jesus, as king, rules over all things. There's not one inch of the creation where Christ does not say, it's mine, and I'm the one who rules over it. But as Jesus teaches us, his primary rule is right inside of us, in here, in our hearts, where he rules us by his word and by his spirit. Okay? Now, why do I take all that time to explain all that? Because because so often... As, 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 as Christians, I think, we, 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 we dive superficially into things. But the world demands more from us. And I think the Lord demands more for us. And so what we, what, what, when, we, when we look at this and we look at Jesus, our prophet, priest, and king, and we understand the implications of that for us and for the world, then we realize Jesus is much, much bigger than what we really realize. And his ministry is much, much richer than what we realize. So that also when we share our faith with others and they ask really, who is Jesus? We say more than just, well, he's the son of God and he's my personal savior. But he's one who's come into this world to reveal to you who God the Father is, to reveal to you the need for the forgiveness of sins, to reveal to you that he has made that sacrifice himself for the forgiveness of your sins. And also, he's come into this world to rule over you and also to rule in you. I mean, all of that comes to play. And when you understand that, then all of a sudden Jesus becomes a much, much bigger figure, right? So the point of a catechetical series is not just to say, okay, let's expand our knowledge of things, but to, to, to create a greater appreciation for our Savior and his calling and what he's done for us and also what he, what he promises to do for the world, okay? But one final thing as we move on, and that is, okay, that's who Jesus is, but who, we are, who are we as Christians, okay? So as you move on in the story, it's, it's Peter who says, you are the Christ, you are the Christ. As he says in the Gospel of Matthew, you are the Christ. You're the living Son of God. Good answer. Now, Jesus responds to Peter now. And Jesus says to Peter, okay, now as the Christ, this Messiah, um, I must suffer and I must die and I must rise again on the third day. Now, you know, if you grow up with the Bible, you know that that's what Jesus Christ has come to do. But remember, this is all kind of new news. And so Jesus says this, the Bible says in our text, he says this very clearly. So it must, have, it must have struck Peter that this Jesus, whom we have been learning from from some time, and who we have grown to, to love and be a friend to, now he's telling us he's going to suffer and he's going to die, and then he's going to rise from the dead. And so Peter Here's where his impulsive character comes into place. Is no, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. And what's Jesus' response? Get behind me. You're a Satan to me. You know what the name Satan means? It means adversary. You're a Satan to me. Peter, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but you're setting your, your heart on the things and your mind on the things of man. You know, you know what he, why he says that? Because you have to ask yourself the question, why did Jesus come into the world in the first place? Right? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whoever believes upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. Based on what? Based on what Jesus Christ has come to do and that is die on the cross to remove that sin, to, to die in our place, that substitutionary atonement. So basically what Jesus is saying is, okay, I am the Christ, and you need to understand my mission as the Christ. I'm moving on to the cross. And Peter says, no, 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 no. And that's why Jesus rebukes him, because Jesus is saying, Peter, as much as I love you, you're an obstacle to me right now. Do not be a temptation. Do not be an obstacle. I need to move on to the cross. That's why he rebukes him in the way that he does. Well, Jesus then gathered together a crowd with his disciples and essentially said to them, I've come to suffer and die and rise from the dead. Whoever among you wishes to follow me will experience the same thing. How does he say it in the passage? Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Oh. So Jesus is identified as the Christ. Now, in so many words, he's identifying us as Christians. What is a Christian? A Christian is an imitator of Christ. A Christian is an apprentice of Christ. That is, he learns from Christ. A Christian is one who, through faith, has, has not only identified with Christ, but has also been united to him. So, for instance, when you read in the book of Romans, in chapter 6 and also 8, it speaks about this beautiful doctrine of union with Christ. So that, just as Jesus suffered, when we live our lives as Christians, Jesus says, you will suffer with me. Um, just as Jesus was crucified, Jesus says, when you're a Christian, you crucify to yourself your old ways in order that you may follow me. Jesus says, just as I was buried, so too you must be buried to your old ways. Just as I have died, you must die to your old ways. And also, just as I have risen from the dead, you too must rise to new life and walk in the light and the life that I give you. That very, simple, that very simply means what it, what it means to be united, united to the person of Christ. As if Christ is saying, this is who I am and this is what has happened to me. Now this is who you are to be. And this is what is ha to happen to you in your own lives. This is what it means to be united to me. Now, one more thing, and then I want to start drawing actually to, to a close here. And that is, again, what, what this catechetical statement is doing now is it's, it's not only saying, not only on the basis of this passage, are we to be, as Jesus says, um, self-denying, world-defying, suffering and dying followers of Jesus Christ. But in that, in that calling, the way that we express our union with Christ is by way of imitating his very office of prophet, priest, and king. And in that, the Heidelberg is drawing from various parts of the scripture as well. So I want to draw your attention, if you'll put that up, look at question answer 32. Okay. First of all, the question is, why is he called Christ that is anointed? Then question 32, all right, now as one who's united to Christ, why are you called a Christian? And the answer is, because I am a member of Christ by faith. I've identified with him by faith, and therefore I share in that anointing. Now, and again, the, anoint, the word anointing means to be set apart and empowered for a certain task. Jesus was set apart and empowered for a certain task in his baptism to be prophet, priest, and king. And Jesus says, if you're united to me by faith, you share in that anointing. You've been set apart and you're empowered to do what? Like me, to be a prophet and a priest and a king. So what do we do as prophets? Well, as prophets, we are called to confess his name, to confess the name of Christ, um, personally, and also before others. You think about it, when, when we sometimes have uh, public professions of faith, right? Uh, oftentimes it's younger individuals who come forward, but sometimes it's also adults who have come to faith later on in life, and they, they, uh, four questions are posed to them, and they give their I do's. What are they doing there? They're publicly confessing Christ. They're exercising their prophetic office at that point. We all are called to do that, to profess Christ daily not just formally and in, and, and in public here in a worship service, but part of our prophetic task also is to confess Christ before the world. When you do that, when you do that, you're exercising prophetic office. So it's not just something that Jesus does or not something that just an Old Testament prophet does. We're all called to that with this, with our mouth, to confess Christ openly. Secondly, we're called to be priests. And as priests, we're to present ourselves as living sacrifices of gratitude to God. What is a, uh, who is a Christian? A Christian is one who dies to self and lives for someone else. A Christian is not one who, who puts himself forward, but it puts Christ forward and puts others forward. That's what it means to live in a priestly way before God. And finally this, we are to reign as kings with Christ. With a free and a good conscience, we're to fight as kings do for their people against sin and the devil in this life and look forward to reign, to rule with him eternally over all things, over all.
creatures. Now, more, more of this could be said in regard to these things, but th- this, is, this is our calling in imitation to Christ. So, so l- let me ask you this. Um, how are you doing in, in, in your calling before the Lord? In terms of, of your, prophetic, uh, your prophetic task, you know, it's very easy to confess Christ personally and to say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I mean, we, we've heard that here this afternoon. But we're in a pretty safe place. Think of the martyrs. If someone uh, held a sword to your neck, would you confess Christ in your prophetic office? That's a hard thing to answer, isn't it? It's a hard thing for me to answer. What would happen when the rubber hits the road in that regard? Um, do you pray that God would help you to fulfill your prophetic task in speaking the gospel before others, the name of Jesus before others. That's part of our priestly calling, to confess him here in this context, to confess him personally, and to confess him before the world. And that's part of the reason why we even started Pathway Christian Church. I mean, we didn't start this church just for us and for our happiness, but so that we might confess him to the city. Or the priestly task, when you, when you, when you look at your life, are you living for others? Or are you living for yourself? Um, the, kind of, the kind of priestly sacrifice or the denial that Jesus is calling us to in this passage of being self-denying, world-defying, suffering and dying followers of Jesus Christ. Do you say, you know what, my life is pretty comfortable right now. Or do you say, you know what, I'm trying to live sacrificially for the Lord. You know, I think of, of uh, two things real quick, um, John and Renee. You know, when they decided to go to Africa, that was, that was not only a prophetic task that they were fulfilling, but it was a priestly task. They were sacrificing themselves for the Ugandan people. Or you think of, of Rob and Mel and with Jaden and um, the blessings of Jaden, but also the challenges of Jason. You know, that's not an easy thing. And they are trying to live as Christian parents. When... You know, with, with a lot of parents in the world, they think about themselves first and they simply leave their kids to their own devices. They've committed themselves to Jaden and we have to come alongside of them and encourage them in that. It's a part of their priestly sacrifice, right? This is where the kind of the rubber hits the road. And of course, there's the, the calling of us as kings. But listen, brothers and sisters, um, I want to I just leave you with this. When Jesus reveals himself as a Christ and he says, if you're going to be followers of me, then what I experience, I'm calling you to experience as well. With all the responsibility of that and all the sacrifice of that, um, that is not an easy thing. I mean, and, and, and then you step back and you say, who, who really would want that responsibility? Who really wants to bear that cost? And that's, that's why, you know, um, some churches today, what they do is when they're really involved in missionary tasks, when they get people in and they start you know, talking to them about the faith, a lot of times they leave that cost to the side and they just think, well, we'll bring that a little bit later on. We first got to kind of bring them in and get them up to speed and, and these kinds of things. And I, I understand that. But really, at the very, Jesus never dealt with people like that. Jesus dealt with people, and when the gospel came to them, he underscored to them immediately, but you got to remember that this is the cost of following me, and this is the responsibility of following me. And it's not easy being a Christian, and it's not going to get any easier, is it? And sometimes, you know, you, 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 we have a few older ones in this congregation, and, you know, we need to appreciate them too. You know, these are, the, 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 when you get to be 70 or 80 years old and they're still following the Lord and they're still open about him, I'm like, wow, you know, that's, that's a lot of years. And they're like the Apostle Paul. Man, I've fought the good fight. I've, I've, I'm nearing the finish, uh, the, the, the finish of the course. And by God's grace, I'm keeping my faith. And I say, praise God for that. Praise God for that. So... But, but here's the thing, and I'll leave you with this irony of Jesus. Is there a lot of responsibility, and is there a lot of cost to being prophet, priest, and king? When you really look at the, how the catechism explains it, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility, it's a lot of cost. But here's the irony of the Bible. I don't know if you've thought about this. Maybe you have. But what Jesus teaches us in the Bible is that... Um, 
the, the irony is this. Jesus teaches us that really only by dying do we actually truly live. Only by dying to ourselves do we actually come alive. Um, only, only by losing ourselves for the cause of Christ do we actually win. Only by being a servant, a slave of Christ, do we truly become free. That's what we have to realize, and that's what we have to bring to the world. There is a cost, there is a responsibility, but in fulfilling that, while there is sacrifice, it's only then that you truly live and you truly flourish as a human being. And may God grant us the ability to, to see that and to fulfill our callings here at Pathway of being what we've seen this afternoon, of being true prophets and priests and kings of our Lord. All right, let's, let's come to the Lord and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of Christ. And Lord, Jesus is very clear that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the anointed one to be our prophet and priest and king. And he's also clear, O oh Lord, we understand from this passage too, that he calls us to the very same things. Lord, we pray that in this weighty threefold calling that we have, that we may not only accept the challenge of this and the responsibility of this, but over time, Lord, that we may also see and experience the, the true blessings of this in our lives, for us personally, but also for the city in which we live and in which we minister. So God, show us that more and more over time, we pray, we ask in Jesus' name. All right, amen.